yes, I'm going to talk about DNA testing. And for me, all of that began with the FBI laboratory. This is uh, back in the, the 1950s. But this was before DNA. And this was, back then it was known as forensic serology. And scientists would examine physical evidence to try to detect the presence of blood and other body fluids. And then they would use methods like ABO typing to attempt to categorize the, the contributor in the stains into one of four types type A, type B, type AB, or type O. Um, it was informative at the time, but in perspective, it wasn't that discriminating. Um, but my forensic, my actual forensic career truly began in the late 1970s, n not the 50s. And, <laughs> and, and, and ironically, some of the same tests that were used at the FBI lab back in that time sort of transcended into the 70s and 90s as well, uh, excuse me, the 70s and 80s as well. Um, but in the 1980s, that's when forensic DNA testing was actually introduced in the United States. And this is one of the first images that was developed. This was one of my cases. Um, and back then, the way you would look at this type of information, it's an x-ray film, it sort of focused for the, the positions of banding patterns. On the left uh, center of the screen, you'll see uh, two columns for banding patterns representing the victim and the suspect in a case. And on the right center of the screen, you'll see banding patterns that equate to the evidence, the crime scene samples. And you sort of line up the positions of those bands and you see if they match or not. And if they do, then you, you may have an identity of an individual in a case. Um, this type of test, like the, the films that you're seeing, the x-ray films, it actually took about three months to, to work a case to develop to get to this end product back then in the 80s. And it would require the, a stain about the size of a quarter, blood stain, to be able to generate that kind of information. Um, I was actually with the Commonwealth of Virginia back then, and Virginia was the first state to implement forensic DNA testing, and this was what we went online with. And I testified in some of the early cases, and, and with that, there was, um, when you introduce a new technology like DNA testing, it's quite a disruption um, from funding to be able to do it, to laboratory planning to be able to carry it out, to probably one of the most important points, and that's legal acceptance. And in one of the, some of the very early DNA cases that I testified on, um, one included a, a rape homicide in which um, there was very little physical evidence, only the key evidence was um, biological material recovered from the body of the victim. I performed DNA testing and we had a match to the suspect in this case. I spent the better part of the week on the stand testifying. Again, this was the early days and the reliability and the and the general acceptance hadn't been achieved quite yet. Um, but at the end, of the end of the week, the technology was accepted and there was a conviction and, and I was excused, excused and able to leave. And as I was leaving the courtroom, I would always try to um, make a quick exit. Um, but in this instance, I wasn't able to. The, uh, the victim's mother, uh, the victim was a, about a 20-year-old female and her mother approached me and um, you know we, we shook hands. And uh, as I turned to leave, she held on to my hand a little tighter, enough that caused me to really make eye contact with her and to, to see. And she told me that um, when she was her daughter's age, she had been a laboratory technician in James Watson's laboratory in Cold Spring Harbor. Um, now for those of you who don't know the history of genetics, um, Dr. Watson and Dr. Crick are uh, credited with discovering the DNA molecule, which actually led to the technology that we have. So that was a defining moment for me to recognize the power of this tool, but also the privilege that goes with it to be part of this, this forensic technology. And like any science, science moves forward, it progresses. And about 10 years later, um, another form of DNA testing was introduced. And this is the, the current method that's used today. It's uh, uh, sh called short tandem repeat analysis. And it's, it's much more sensitive, it's much faster. The, you know, I mentioned the, the time and the size of stains previously. This method um, requires, instead of a, a blood stain the size of a quarter, it could just be a thread that's on clinging to your shirt. Um, instead of taking three months, you can turn a case around in 24 to 36 hours, much faster. So the, the application, the scope of application is much greater. Um, and, and that's what's commonly used today. And, and it's based on the premise that you're looking for repeating segments that's present in everyone's DNA molecule. It's just the number of those seg segments that varies from person to person. So my quick little analogy is 
to show you that, you know, sentence structure, the cat ran very fast, the cat ran very, very fast. You, know, you can sort of see the difference in the sentence sizes, the lengths, that's really the premise behind this technology. Um, what I want to also mention, though, is like the first technology that I, I described, this also created disruptions. There was, again, education, training that was necessary, added components, such as DNA legislation. Um, what happened is it became clear that being able to, the possibility of creating DNA libraries of individuals who have um, convicted offenders and arrestees where there's a high recidivism rate, propensity to commit crimes again, could be of value. And so the FBI constructed a national DNA database in which there are indices of convicted offenders and uh, arrestees that can be compared to crime scene evidence and potentially produce matches and solve investigations. Presently, there are over 13 million DNA profiles in the FBI's database, and over a quarter of a million um, cases have been um, solved or aided through the, through the database. Sometimes, though, um, disruptions can cause a technology change or a change in how it's used. And the events of September 11th are, are a prime example of this. The destruction, uh, the attack on American soil, the, uh, the Pentagon, the World Trade Center, the Shanksville air crash, um, these became massive crime scenes of a proportion that we had never dealt with before. And it meant that we had to start looking at DNA testing in a, in a means differently, to begin looking at how we could try to identify the dead um, and, and aid in, in further investigations going forward. Back at, at the FBI, when I was on board at that time, our mission changed. For the first time, our mission became focusing on um, how to combat terrorism um, and counterintelligence. Those were the key elements that we needed to, to move forward with. And that led to applying DNA, again, in different manners. We started to look at some of the devices that could be recovered from um, terrorism scenes, such as improvised explosive devices, where potentially you could recover a small amount of DNA from the wires that the terrorists may have tied together to form the device. And more creatively, we began to construct uh, DNA genetic libraries or um, pedigrees to, uh, based on the biological relatives of some of the uh, in individuals of high interest to try to piece together what those individuals may look like genetically so that if they were ever captured or if, if their remains were ever recovered, we could authenticate who they were. But like all technologies, uh, today's technology does have limitations. And while it is a very sensitive test, there are samples that exceed its capability, such as single hairs or compromised skeletal remains that have been badly decomposed and degraded. Um, likewise, there's operational limitations that happen. That is, the DNA database, while it's vital and, and, and very integral to supporting the criminal justice system, there are limitations with it. Not all the suspects are going to be in the database. So there's a large number of searches that don't result in, in matches. And when that happens, sometimes an investigation isn't able to progress forward. And there's also disruptions that can be almost at times um, driven sort of socially. One of the cases I want to talk to you about real, very quickly is, is one that happened in North Carolina. Um, the photograph on the far left is a young man at the time. His name is Daryl Hunt. Um, he was accused and convicted of a rape homicide back in the late 1980s in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, the, the test, the evidence that was used to convict Mr. Hunt at that time was uh, very limited, and some of it was similar to the, the ABO methods that I started this presentation about. My laboratory was, was contacted. We had just recently validated and implemented a new technology, DNA-based. It was very sensitive, and we were asked to re-examine the evidence. And when we did, we were able to detect a DNA profile from the, biologi the biological material that was recovered from the victim's body, and it did not match Mr. Hunt. And I testified in a hearing in Winston-Salem, um, North Carolina, conveying that information to the court. The judge, however, felt that while this information demonstrated that Mr. Hunt wasn't the rapist, it, it didn't prove his innocence of, of the actual homicide. Um, Mr. Hunt remained in jail for an, an additional 10 years until, by, by chance, an individual was arrested in the state of Alabama, put into the database, and he matched against the uh, biological material from the victim. 
Um, at, at that point, Mr. Hunt was finally freed, and, and it took a while for the, the DNA technology to really gain an understanding by this particular court to allow this to happen. And that brings us to where we're going, what we're on the cusp of. Um, as I said, technology moves forward. And what we're looking at now is a method known as next generation sequencing. And instead of looking at for repeating segments of the DNA molecule, we're actually focusing in on the, on the letters that make up the bases or the words that are in those sentences. So just a subtle letter change from C in the word cat to B in the word bat to H in the word hat that changes what the word means, it changes the, the inflection of the word, and it allows you to gain more information each through this, through this type of examination. And we're not limited to just looking at one or two sentences that might be on a genetic page of an individual, but rather we're looking at the entire page, all the sentences that make up that, that page of that person, and we're comparing it to another person. And we're going through all 250 of those pages that might make up that genetic book. So there's a lot of information that we're able to harness and gain from this. And what that allows us to do is to be able to take a lot of the conventional tests that are available today, those are the ones that are kind of listed vertically on the, the left column, and presently each one of those tests requires an amount of sample to be tested to go from left to right to get a result. Um, with the sequencing technology that we're embarking on, we're able to consolidate all of those tests into a single work stream. And that allows us to minimize the amount of sample and gain more time efficiency in generating results. Battelle and the Department of Justice are, are very proud to, to share that we've been collaborating on a, a study, a 19-month study that's in progress in which we're assessing the feasibility of this technology to be able to be implemented in, in forensic labs and probably about a year away from having that completed. The sequencing goes beyond what I just described. It also adds a, a level of disruption that we're going to have to deal with, and that has to do with the information that's possible to gain. In addition to all the different markers that I, I just sort of truncated and described, there's the potential to be able to, from a crime scene sample, such as a cigarette or chewing gum recovered at, at the scene, to be able to, to, to generate information that could predict the physical characteristics or the ancestral origin of the individual who left that DNA behind. Possibly, you know, their hair color, their eye color, um, maybe in, over time an actual facial composition that could, could be used to represent who they were. All of this information could be very powerful um, intelligence leads, but it could also be part of that, that package, solving that instance when the database search comes up empty, which happens frequently. But I think the most compelling and urgent need of where this technology will go is the humanitarian effort that it can provide. And that's, um, over the years we've seen mass disasters, the tsunami, um, in which thousands of people lost their lives. It's very difficult to characterize DNA from those samples. They're because they're so limited and so compromised. And over 100,000 individuals have been reported missing in the United States, with the unreported number probably two or three times that, and many of them reaching untimely deaths result in skeletal remains that are very difficult to, to analyze. And that's where I think the power of this test lies for going forward. And so while I think overall from, this tech, from what I'm describing, I think we can see that technology always moves forward, and with that, disruption will be constant. But forensic scientists, we're used to dealing with the disruption and we'll find a way to, to deal with the, the added hurdles that come with this technology. But what's most important, though, is the advantages that this technology introduces. And that's the potential to be able to solve the toughest cases that have never been solved before. To be able to demonstrate compelling information to exonerate the falsely accused. And to provide a voice for the silent by helping to identify the missing. Thank you very much.